Hello and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video. This is an extra, extra one I'm doing today because I had some content left over from yesterday. Yesterday's video went too long, so I brought it over today, but it's a bit too short for, for a whole video. So I'm going to add just a few bits that have just sort of come through. Uh, there's some news here. Uh, sorry, this is a Ukraine war update extra video, giving you the extra tidbits and information to give you the context of the war. It's not a frontline update. Uh, at least 50 more units of military equipment have arrived in Belarus from Russia. Monitoring group Belarusian Gayan writes that an echelon arrived in Baranovici with 43 trucks, five fuel tankers and two ZU-23-2 anti-aircraft guns. May, many trucks have the Z symbol. Okay, this is interesting. This has happened a number of times uh, in Belarus over the last really month or, or so. Russia is sending in a bunch of equipment to Belarus. Why? What's going on here? There are maybe three options, but this first option I'm going to give you, I'm going to discount trade straight away. These could be for training purposes. So they could be sending a whole bunch of equipment to be trained on so that people can learn how to do it. I don't know that you send fuel trucks. I don't know that you send... The, the equipment that has been sent to do training. Uh, you maybe only need a few of them, and then they cycle through training on that, but there are echelons of equipment being sent, so I don't think that's that's the case. So there are really two options. Either Russia and Belarus are going to attack from Belarus, or it could be just Russia attacking from Belarus without actual Belarusian soldiers. Not 100% sure what, what advantage Belarus would have by not sending soldiers but allowing their country to be used as a springboard directly for attack um they may that might be sort of trying to tread too fine a line between not helping russia entirely and then helping them enough but anyway there could be some attack coming from belarus or this could all be a psyops operation trying to fool the, the ukrainians this is the where the that particular echelon has been sent. There have been echelons and, and troops sent basically all over the place. Now, there have also been reports of Russia sending troops in and then sending them back again. In other words, that does look psy psyops, does look like psyops, which is kind of trying to psych out the Ukrainians, trying to make them maybe send forces to the northern border to try and... Uh, you get them to use up resources and personnel unnecessarily uh, while these guys just do training and I don't know what else. But I mean, the other option is that this stuff is going to be used for um, for attacking through the northern border. And I don't know that that makes any kind of real sense for Russia to do. I don't know that they are going to have that much capability that much capacity of force, the amount of force to be able to negotiate some pretty tough uh, territory here. This is particularly in, in the area I'm pointing to now, the north west of, uh, key, of um, Ukraine. This is marshy, boggy. Uh, there are lots of rivers. You would need bridge building equipment. That's going to be, and it's also been heavily mined. So this is going to be a difficult area to come through. And if you're going to move more towards Chernihiv, they already tried this before and they didn't reach Kyiv successfully. I mean, they got to the outskirts and, and found it too difficult. You need an awful lot of troops to take on Kyiv. So I don't really know what they would achieve by attacking from the north unless it's something like take journey but then you what's the point in that I, I so i don't really know i don't understand it fully um if it's a psyops operation then i would say that's broadly just wasteful um yeah I, I let me know in the thread whether you think russia and belarus are likely to attack from the uh, through the northern border um there have been two days of successive significant air losses for the russians and by significant i mean one fixed wing aircraft and one ka-52 lost on both the last two days which is fairly significant russia appeared to be losing some significant amount of material the question is whether they lost uh, the crew in these losses as well uh, that would be pretty bad 
Um, so this is the remains of a Su-25 that was shot down, one of one of the ones that's been re recently reported. N nothing particularly interesting about that other than this is evidence of the figures that we see in the morning. So when I report those figures happening, you get some trolls, some sort of pro-Russian trolls saying this is just propaganda. It's like, well, okay, here's a claim. One, one aircraft, one helicopter. Here's footage, one aircraft. Do you know what I mean? Like... The reason I show you this is to at least try and give some kind of evidential basis to those figures. Um, OK, let's just have a little look at what Alexei Arestovich says, who uh, this is translated by Dmitry War translated. And he is sort of a spokesperson for the Ukrainians. A few nuggets in here. So a few things mentioned on a battlefield update. Um, Russia have started reinforcing Zaporizhia, Bakhmut, Solodar, Liman directions. So that's pretty much everywhere. With approximately 10,000 draftees having some limited training during the last two to three months, they will slowly accumulate and attempt an offensive. So Zelensky is discussing with international partners about options to make this offensive the last one. And that, I presume, he means here, uh, that is Dmitry translating this, means the Russian offensive. So they want to make this the last Russian offensive. There are three possible scenarios. I'm trying to unpick this. North and everywhere, which pretty much sounds everywhere. Kharkiv, Zaporizhia, Donetsk, Luhansk. So that'd be everywhere apart from Kherson, by the looks of it, or just Donetsk, Luhansk. Uh, likely Russia will only attempt sending 200,000 at Donetsk, Luhansk. I mean, that's a big number, right? Uh, um, but the quality of those 200,000 is much lower than of a regular army. Then it goes on to say Tokmak, location with some 80 Russian soldiers hit. Uh, I have reported that. It could be the one at the hospital I was talking about. Similar attacks, group of 50, 80, 130 soldiers hit. Happens at least three to four times a day. This is super interesting because quite often, even on like lower sort of days when the Ukrainians release figures for, say, 530 liquidated personnel, if you look up and down all the lines, 530 is still quite a lot for just small arms fire that's taking place or maybe IEDs dropped from uh from drones maybe a bit of artillery here there's still there still leaves a lot of numbers to to be gained because I I think even in Bakhmut you're not going to have like hundreds of soldiers dying a day in those ways like actually that's quite a high number and if you do that's not going to be happening elsewhere. It might just happen in Bakhmut, but everywhere else is going to be, you know, five or six here, three or four there, maybe a dozen over there. But but I think to make up those numbers to even to the five hundreds, but especially when it's been sort of seven late seven hundreds and whatever, last few days have had some really high, much higher numbers. You're going to need where where they're getting those numbers from, and this makes sense of that. And I, I keep saying that that this is happening that many times a night. High Mars. I know some of the Russian bots are having to go at me for saying the word High Mars too much, but you know these GMLRS and High Mars, but are hitting places with troop concentrations that seems to be a change in in strategy for the ukrainians and that must be really hurting the russians so yeah uh going further forward um it looks like the restrictions on supplying any weapon types have been lifted whoa so western manufacturing still lags the amount of 155 mil shells manufactured in, in a year are used by ukraine in 50 days Western aid, as usual, includes planning for maintenance, spare parts and training. Um, it looks like there will be accumulation of heavy mechanized units at a certain date. The only task for such units is offensive. Offensive can only happen when Russia has exhausted its offensive capabilities. So it looks like I wonder, well, I wonder whether Ukraine are waiting to do their offensive until Russia try their offensive. Because if they're putting all their troops into an offensive and then Russia does an offensive, they don't have the troops to defend against that necessarily. And that would upset their offensive. So that could be why I was talking about how Zaporizhia hasn't happened because they've had to send troops up to Bakhmut to defend. Uh, I don't. I wonder whether this is actually what's going on or this is happening as well. They're waiting for that Russian attack. Um, when that happens, Kharkiv operation will look like child's play wow i mean that's big talk right but if if there's any truth in that i mean they really could be accumulating a lot of troops and a lot russia have been saying this for ages russia have been saying they've been accumulating troops up in the svatova kremina um axis they've been accumulating troops in zaporizhia 
uh, okay, but what's happening with them? They've been accumulating equipment. Okay, yeah, but what's happening? Well, they are waiting. And he says, when it happens, it's going to be big. Now, is that a bit of psyops, a bit of psyching out the Russians? Or is that genuinely true? Uh, I I am very interested to see you know what's gonna what what's gonna happen how this is all gonna play out. Um, so two of the previous never categories have already been planned: Patriot and uh, Patriot Air Defense and tanks. Remaining categories are aviation and long range missiles. So important here: JDAM bombs that were announced previously should be launched from aircraft with NATO avionics. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are NATO airplanes, but that the the Su jets, the Sukhoi jets or uh, MiG jets have to be updated with NATO avionics. So as he continues, even if those upgrades are of existing aircraft, that would be open to more capabilities. That's a bit cryptic. I wonder what that means. Um, uh, there you go. It talks about Wagner releasing some of those... Uh, convicts after six months of um fighting on the front lines a uh, bit of a pr operation that so now i'm going to go on and just add on the rest that i had from yesterday but i thought that was some useful content to give you as well moving away from equipment being given uh, i've gone on long enough on that uh, here is uh, in occupied vasilivka zaporizhia region something flew into a russian commander's office uh, i think this looks like partisan activity uh, this video got me thinking, though, and I know there's lots of debris here because uh, one of these buildings has, Commander's building, has been uh, attacked. But I was wondering whether the general services are, like, are there you know, people cleaning up the streets in occupied regions? Have Russia got all the municipal services sorted? You know, what's it like to live under occupied uh, Russia, because you hear of like the fire services and the bin men still working in Bakhmut. I don't know if that's still the case, but certainly up till recently, the bin men were still like working. Uh, half the people have left. Uh, there's shells landing in Bakhmut, but the bin men are still working. And I wonder whether there's a difference between uh, how things are operating near the front lines for uh, Ukraine and how municipal services are being provided uh, all over Ukraine compared to. Uh, occupied territories or under control of the russians um and whether people are going god i wish it was i wish it was the ukrainians still in charge here because things are rubbish or are the russians doing a good job you know uh, open question so here here's a bit of footage of uh, a javelin so recon and strike unit hornet shows how a javelin meets a bmp3 so this is a third iteration of the infantry fighting vehicle the bmp and I, what I want to show you is a trajectory of the javelin. So this is a man, oh no, it's not a man pad. This is an ATGM, so an anti-tank guided missile fired from the shoulder. But look how it goes up. So there's a BMP. It comes up from the, it comes up from the left here. There. Look at that upwards trajectory. To get some serious height before coming down. And blowing it up now normally that would uh, go for the turret uh there is a turret on there i you know I, I don't know whether it just didn't quite hit but obviously it's done the damage it needs to do it's taking that machine out and that ain't going anywhere so yeah just um fascinating trajectory on that let's just see that one more time for your delectation up And bang. I don't know whether that's already been hit or whether that's the exhaust fumes of that vehicle. Um, who knows? Uh, next thing is, I did some research, says Defmon. So this is, as many of you have pointed out, there are only 20 high miles delivered. The actual amount has never been anything I care about. So I just quickly looked at a list. That puts the Russian MOD claimed destroyed high miles at 210%. So there have been 20 high miles delivered. One four M one four two high Mars. The Russians have claimed to have destroyed forty two of them. <laughs> the Ukrainians are saying not one single high Mars being destroyed. Now there's outright lies. There's also uh, Russians hitting a bunch of decoys. This was particularly happening earlier in the conflict. The Ukrainians were making wooden decoys and they were getting taken out. 
Um, and then the Russian would count those and say, look, we've destroyed all these HIMARS. And the Ukrainians are saying, no, we still got them all. Thank you very much. It's so difficult to hit HIMARS because you fire them and then you drive them off. And unless you know where they are, unless you are following that, but you won't have drones operating generally that far behind the lines, um, I, I guess you could do. If these things are just constantly moving around, it is so difficult to hit them. They shoot and scoot, job done. Russians claim they hit them. You know, they claim about uh, Drew's Kivka where they're like loading onto a train. Why would you be loading high miles onto a train? Like these things drive around, release their rockets, job done. You drive them places. You'd only need to put them on a train if you're getting them the hell out there back to the west. I don't know. For a, could be taking them to get fixed up. They're, they're, they're broken down. But then, you know, that's some serious, you know, if, if a high mile had been hit, you might want to do that. But if it just needs general repairs, you, you would do it. You wouldn't need to put it on a train. You'd do it where it is. It's too dangerous to put it on a train and send it away. So, yeah, the whole the whole rationale behind or all the claim of the Russians there was was pretty crazy. Um, but again, uh, M270, the Mars or LRU, these are other guided Gimlers, other guided uh, multiple launch rocket systems 13 delivered seven destroyed so apparently they the russians claim they destroyed 54 percent of them m triple seven howitzers 155 delivered 109 destroyed so 71 percent of them i'd be really interested to see w what the actual figure is there rather than the russian claim figure um i guess i can look at oryx to see what the uh, visual confirmation is so defmon then said look uh this is yeah um these stats are, are pretty um pretty nuts uh it doesn't have to be these big key pieces of kit though so here's an example as the, phillips o'brien says of the cost effective war, warfare that ukraine ukrainians are deploying and using uh, i wonder whether the russians are doing this as well i don't know uh let me know do the russians do, have a lot of successful um ieds drop from uh drones do i know that we've seen them dropped on a few troops and a, a few bits and pieces but we have seen so much more footage from the Ukrainians. Is that because of my confirmation bias and looking in the places that I see much more footage of that? Or, you know, is there a bias going on there? Um, but this is an, an incredible amount of damage that can be done with one simple IED. So you've got, one would assume, an ammunition dump here. And these are the trucks that have been delivering that. So when you have uh, drones, that they are seeing this, like we saw up in, was it Svatova, where they took out ammunition for two weeks. And, and I got that a bit confused. I was thinking two weeks for what? One cannon? Ten cannons? No, it was they've been delivering stuff there solidly every day for two weeks. They've built up this ammunition reserve. And then the, Russia, and then the Ukrainians, because they've been watching them fill this place up for two weeks, and then blew it up this could be the place it might not be in Svatova this could be near Svatova who knows but anyway th this is uh um a couple of trucks and yeah bang one simple IED there taking out what is clearly a whole bunch of ammunition there's a lot of fire going on there straight away and that is pretty intense fire uh, and after that yeah not a lot left of that building and more importantly not a lot left of the ammunition inside uh, i'm not sure what that says um uh, that bit there but uh anyway i just thought that was uh, a, a useful bit of footage to show that you can get a lot of a benefit out of a very low cost. Uh, Trent Telenko, just coming towards the end. I just pulled up daily uh, Ukrainian Ministry of Defense kill claims covering 29th of December 2022 through to the 4th of January. Uh, the total, the number was 5,130 Russian combat deaths. Now, I always say this is indicative that the true numbers are unknown and possibly unknowable, certainly at the moment. But he's just added up those those Ukrainian released figures. And he's saying, well, you know, if we take these as as true, the AFU is continuing with its death by a thousand cuts, deep interdiction campaign against ammo storage, POL storage, HQ elements, uh, and has now extended in it, it in a systematic way 
to Russian personnel concentrations. This is something I reported yesterday that uh, that has been like Michael Kaufman uh, has said this, that the Ukrainians have changed their tactics. They are now hitting personnel concentrations rather than equipment concentrations because it could be that they're actually struggling to find equipment concentrations now. They've taken out most of the stuff and the Russians have adapted and moved their equipment um, depots to behind 85 kilometers to 100 kilometers back from the front line so now they're hitting troop accumulations or it could be that actually they find that the the high value target of troop accumulations and the dent it does to capacity and morale um is huge and if you if if you look at what happened in makivka and the military bloggers going absolutely mental at the russian army then you understand that, that that's been really useful from a pr point of view um, so he says this cold weather refuge practice with the Mobix appears very widespread, which likely mean makes it a central directive to keep the poorly winter clothed Mobix fresh before deployment to the forward edge of the battle area, the FIBA. So the idea is that because they are, don't have very good equipment, they're keeping the Mobix or mobilized troops all in one place to keep them warm and fresh until the very last minute and say, right, now you're going to the front line. And it keeps it. Whereas if they sent them to the front line earlier or they put them in other places and less concentrated and they're feeling the cold more and it becomes a bit of a problem. The predicted deep freeze starting on the 7th of January. So there is this deep freeze coming next week means deep frozen ground as early as Monday, uh, ending the fall mud season. Uh, autumn for those who, who use the word properly. Um, uh, whatever. Uh, the systematic destruction of Mobit cold weather refuges in, in occupied Ukraine, and that's uh, looking at the weather there, um, in the last week means Russia simply doesn't have places it can both disperse Mobix and have shelters to stay warm in before that Arctic cold front arrives, let alone prepare more cold weather shelters for the Mobit replacement stream coming in behind them. Straight up, depending on how you choose to number a Russian infantry battalion, it looks like 8 to 13 Russian Mobit infantry BTGs have been shattered in the last week in this latest interdiction campaign, and the administrative chaos it is causing has weakened the entire front. There can be no formed Russian tactical reserve groups involving Mobix anywhere in occupied Ukraine. So he's basically saying that the destruction that these uh, these hits have been having on personnel means that, that the mobilised troops, these reserve groups of mobilised troops have been effectively, you know, either decimated or, or rendered useless at the moment as the, as they are kind of picking up the pieces the russians are simply too busy scrambling to disperse and or replace them so the other thing is that then the the mobilized troops that has have got left they're thinking right we can't keep them all together in one place quick send them out to into smaller groups all around but then that's really chaotic which also means there's a lot of new russian radio and cell phone traffic lighting up to identify more russian command posts and further mobit cold weather refuges interesting so now that they're dispersing all these troops and they're having to communicate so much more with all these groups of troops it means that the, the ukrainians can monitor that traffic that radio traffic and then know where these troops are and then hit these troops in maybe in smaller concentrations but know exactly where they are um, all this is happening just in time for the grant to freeze hard enough for large scale mobile operations uh, that the Ukraine has talked about. Uh, Ukrainians have talked about all December. The very warm 2022 23 winter to date means that there will be a much shorter winter campaigning season before the spring mud season arrives. Call it five to eight weeks at the very outside. The spring mud season, when it arrives, lasts longer because of the episodic melting of the winter snow accumulation. So expect a fierce and bloody winter campaign soon, uh, then another protracted attrition phase in the next mud season for months. So thank you for that, Trent Delanco. And I'm going to leave you on this, which is Tim White reporting, let's start the thread with a chuckle with this scene from Kazakhstan. According to the poster on Telegram, a middle-aged woman telling a couple of guys from Russia exactly what she thinks. So remember, Kazakhstan is kind of a satellite um, Caucasus nation, former Soviet um, re republic or former part of the Soviet Union. Uh, Putin is a dickhead. Uh, Ukraine will win. All Kazakhstan hates you. That's harsh. Harsh. But here she goes. She's absolutely giving it some. She's not afraid there. These guys look like they're drinking by the bus stop. I'll be like afraid that they don't set upon you. 
I mean, she's got some courage there. There you go. And another thing. Yeah. Yeah. Putin. Everyone hates you. Putin. Ukraine. Something, something, something. Insult, insult, insult. Good stuff. That's what we like to see. If, uh, you know, if that is widespread in these other nations, then Russia has a, a tougher time of it. Um, anyway, thank you. That was a long one. I told you there's lots to talk about. Please like, subscribe, share. I want to just give some props to people who have helped out loads recently. Here's a shout out to the new members of the channel who have joined. Mark Schwarman, Hans-Peter Nielsen, Tyler Crockett, John Lloyd, Memoz, Mitch Mazarol, Kevin Alexander, Yonanis Kilioris, Ian Ratner. Thank you so much for your support. I'm going to try and put out the odd sort of bit of content for the for these good people who are supporting the channel. Uh, members only content but um, or, or other perks I can think of. But thank you so much for your support. It really does mean a lot and it allows me to continue doing what I do. Uh, at the moment, I seem to have no time to do anything else at the moment. I'm spending a lot of time feeding my obsession and hopefully feeding your obsession as well. And can I just say a big thanks also to people on PayPal and Buy Me A Coffee. So on PayPal, props to Jan Narkiewicz, Dimitri Valentin, um, who else? Richard Keck, uh, Jacob Passman, Del Dakin, Jonathan Cairns, Legends One and All, and others. Hadju Imri, Andres Urdovic, JG Bachelot, Mark Schwarman again. Um, others, Egon Fredrickson, Davinki, Neil, Ian Ratner again. Thank you so much for your massive generosity on all of these platforms. Uh, honestly, you know, it is, as I keep saying, like without that, literally I wouldn't be providing content so it's that simple so thank you thank you thank you and I hope I know I go on a lot and I ramble but I hope I provide something for some people that they find useful or enjoyable or informative or whatever you know thank you